Hey guys, welcome back to another week of astronomy. So, this week we're going to study the remainder of the chapter on the solar system. So let's actually, let's actually go to that. Let's see, where is that guy? Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so, uh, that's chapter 8. We, last week we studied the terrestrial planets and the Jovian planets, chapter 6 and 7. This week we're going to take a step back and look at the uh, origin of the solar system and a little bit about extrasolar planets. So let's take a quick run through the chapter contents. Uh, the first thing is that we're going to talk about the stuff we missed last time. We talked about planets, but we didn't talk about any of the other things. Asteroids, comets, meteors, and so on. Some of these are the oldest material that we have in the solar system that has not been processed at all since the solar system was formed. In particular, the comets fall into that category. We're going to talk about the origin of the solar system. There's a very important theory about how the solar system formed called the solar nebula theory. It also plays a role in the formation of stars in general. We'll learn more about star evolution, formation, death, and so on next week when we get to chapters 10 and 11. But this week it's focusing on the development of the constituents of the solar system other than the, the star, and that includes um, mostly planets, asteroids, comets, and things like that. Finally, at the end of the chapter, we'll be looking at extrasolar planets. Now next week, when we study stars, we'll have enough background that we'll be able to actually go and get some data about extrasolar planets, analyze that data, and calculate from that data the mass and um, distance of an extrasolar planet from its star. Even though we can't measure the extrasolar planet directly, there's enough indirect evidence in the starlight coming from the star that we can deduce these things. So that's kind of exciting. The next chapter, chapter 9, is really where we get into the meat of astronomy because we're going to learn about stars. And this chapter is in particular about the overall distribution of star types, how they behave, how they uh, appear, and so on. We're not going to talk about the evolution of stars, how they're born, how they live, and how they die. That comes next week. But we're going to talk about the observational properties of stars. How do they appear? How do we understand that appearance? How do we interpret what we measure when we look at stars? And a lot of that has to do with uh, brightness, temperature, size, and mass. So those are the main points of this chapter. And there's a way to categorize stars according to their temperature, according to their luminosity, and to build a kind of graphical diagram of how they're distributed called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So that is a central piece of this chapter, and that's what our project is about this week, is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. The other really important idea is the difference between apparent brightness, intrinsic brightness, and luminosity. And so I want to just take a second to talk about that, the apparent brightness is the brightness that a star appears to have when you look at it in the sky. So the stars that you can see with the naked eye are cataloged as having a magnitude from 1 to 6, say. And we talked about visual magnitudes. We talked about stellar brightnesses earlier in the book. Uh, you might want to go back and, and review some of that. But there's also this no notion of intrinsic brightness. And the intrinsic brightness of a star is the brightness it would have if it were at some standard distance away. See, the trouble is, the brightness of a star depends on its distance. So the farther away it is, the dimmer it appears. The brightness goes down like 1 over distance squared. So if you double the distance to a star, its brightness goes down by a factor of 4. So you can see just by looking at the brightness of, that a star appears to have, as you look at it in the sky, you cannot deduce its intrinsic brightness directly. So a lot of what we do in this chapter is to talk about how do, I, how do I interpret the appearance of a star in terms of distance, intrinsic brightness, apparent brightness, and so on. For stars that are not too far away, we can actually get their distance geometrically. 
We can measure the position of the star in the sky at one time of year. We can wait six months, look at the apparent position of the star in the sky at that later time, and if it's not too far away, we can use geometry to figure out the distance to the star. And that's described very nicely in the book. For stars that are farther away, that method is not practical because the change in apparent position in the sky is much too small and we can't measure it reliably. For those stars, we need another method. And the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram gives us a way to deduce the intrinsic brightness of a star without having to measure its distance or to uh, know its distance directly. Okay? So luminosity is simply the total energy that a star puts out. So uh, here's a good analogy. If you go to the store and buy a 100 watt light bulb, 100 watts is its luminosity. That's how much energy it actually puts out. Its brightness depends on how far away it is. If you are 10 feet from the 100 watt light bulb, it'll have a different brightness than if you're 100 feet from the 100 watt light bulb. But the luminosity doesn't change. The luminosity is simply how much energy is it putting out, irrespective of where you are and how you happen to be viewing it. So that's a quick overview of the material we'll be talking about. The study guides for chapters 8 and 9 are ready for you guys to look at. If you have any questions about anything, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. I'd be happy to talk about those guys. I've gotten a lot fewer questions than I was expecting, so um, please don't hesitate to check in and ask questions. Let's talk about that DANG project. So the project is basically a set of slides that I've shared with you. Uh, what I want you to do is to make a copy of the slides. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Or, if you like, you can download them as a PowerPoint, possibly, or uh, what else do you have there? That's probably the most useful format would be a PowerPoint. But you could also just make a copy and edit them on uh, Google Docs. Then what I want you to do is simply to go through the slides, and where it says to fill in the blanks, you delete the text that's there and like type your name here. Or in this one, you're going to go in and actually fill in the blanks on this table. This is uh, developed from materials that were available at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And uh, the problem with the materials as they were existed there, you could download a document and print it out, but I have no easy way to get you guys to submit it. So what I've done is to take the idea of that HR diagram project and convert it to something where we can do this online. So the idea is you just go through and edit. Uh, here's a question. Use the relationship that luminosity goes like radius squared times temperature to the fourth to fill in this table. So the idea is that if temperature is 1 and luminosity is 1, that means the radius. Well, that's got to be 1, right? Because 1 times 1 is 1. So the, the point is you can figure out the missing blank by using the relationship between luminosity, size, and temperature and in this chart. These guys, the way this is written, the luminosity in solar units is equal to the radius in solar units times the temperature in solar units. So when it says the temperature is 1, what it means is it's the same temperature as the sun. If the temperature here were 2, it would mean it would have, like this guy down here, that would have twice the temperature of the sun, and so on. But you can simply leave it in these relative units, and then the equation becomes, actually, I can just edit this. In those units, the equation really is an equal sign. L is equal to r squared times t to the fourth. Good. Same way with this guy. This is the mass-luminosity relationship for main sequence stars. you got some masses you got some luminosities, you can use this formula. Again, uh, in solar units, I can use equals there. Okay, so here we have a question where you want to put an X in the box. So if you think that hot stars are found, uh, what, at the top of the diagram, you put an X there. If you think they're someplace else, you put an X where you think they are. So let's see, what else have we got here? Again, that's fairly obvious. There are some ones where you're going to answer this question. It's a written response, so you type your answer into the box. Uh, here's one that's a little different. So I want you to draw a blue arrow on the y-axis showing the direction of increasing intrinsic luminosity. Well, if you go look at the diagram, I already did that. There's a blue arrow already on the diagram, so you don't actually have to do part A. But part B says to draw a red arrow 
showing the direction of increasing surface temperature. So the idea is you go in here and you make an arrow. And let's see, where did the arrow go? Aha, there I have an arrow, right? And I change the color to red. So how do I do that? I go up here and I change it to red. And now I can move the arrow around however I want. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. I can make the arrow point however I want in order to satisfy the question. That's the idea. Uh, what's the next one? There's an answer. Uh, the last one, this is the last question. You've got this guy uh, that's one solar unit of luminosity, one uh, solar radius, and one solar temperature. In other words, the temperature relative to the sun is one. That means it has the same temperature as the sun. This one's actually already there. There's an X on the diagram where that guy goes. Now you're going to put in star A. And it gives you this radius. It gives you the temperature. So you can go back and use the formula. Where did it go? For the relationship between luminosity, radius, and temperature. Here we go. Luminosity, radius, and temperature. Use that formula to go back and calculate the luminosity. Boom. Right there. Yeah. And then plot the luminosity on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Okay? That's the idea. So that's the whole project. It's very different than the last projects where I had you write a report with an introduction and references and all that stuff. In this case, this project is going to be just fill in all these blanks and submit it. So there's no report this time. It's much more straightforward. There is a resource I'd like to point out that you can use to do this project, and that is the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell what you call Explorer. Let's see if I can find out. If you go under Resources, you go under, uh, I think it's Project Resources. Is that it? Nope, those are the slides. It must be under Online Resources. There you have it. The University of Nebraska at Lincoln HR Diagram Explorer. You click on that guy, and it takes you to this flash based applet that you can use to explore. Here's the HR Diagram. And you can just click and drag this guy around, and it will tell you what's the temperature of that guy, what's the intrinsic luminosity of that guy, and what is the radius. Now, the temperature is in Kelvin, so to get the temperature in solar units, you have to divide by 5800. But the luminosity is in solar units already, and the radius is in solar units already. So that's the only tricky bit. Um, and you can answer the questions uh, with the help, if you like. You don't need to use this guy, but you're certainly welcome to use it, of this guy. You can see the actual size of the star relative to the sun. If the thing is blue, that means it's hotter than the sun. If it's red, it means it's uh, redder than the sun. If it matches the sun's color, I guess it's uh, the same. Yeah. There's another couple of check boxes and stuff down here. You can show... Uh, the isoradius lines are lines of constant radius. So all the stars on this green line have the same radius as the sun. The stars on this green line have a radius 10 times the radius of the sun. So if I go up to this guy, you'll notice it's 10 times the radius of the sun. If I go to this guy, it's one-tenth, roughly. I'm, I'm off by a little bit, it looks like. One-tenth the radius of the sun. There you go. And, and so on. Uh, but if you don't like those ones there, you can get rid of them, right? Uh, you can get rid of the main sequence. That's that red line on there. If you don't like that, you don't have to show it. Luminosity classes show you the supergiants, the giants, the dwarfs, and so on. Uh, the white dwarfs. The uh, instability strip is just a part of the HR diagram where stars that are not stable live. Okay. The other thing you can do is plot actual stars. Like the nearest stars are plotted down here. Um, the brightest stars are these guys up here. You can also get both the brightest and the nearest. And you can also look at the stars that are both bright and near. These are both bright and near guys. And, uh, and that's basically the whole tool. So uh, if you have any questions about the tool or how you might use it to work on your project, please don't hesitate to ask. I think that's it. I think that's everything for this week. I uh, hope you guys have a great week, and I'll talk to you soon.